Welcome to Historic New England's new streaming series, Leading Voices, Conversations on Preservation, Resilience, and Cultural Philanthropy. I'm Vin Cipolla, President and CEO of Historic New England. Our Leading Voices series hosts cultural and philanthropic leaders from the United States and abroad discussing different facets of the critical, catalytic role private philanthropy plays in building, protecting, and ensuring our cultural fabric. Cultural philanthropy has played an essential role in the growth of Historic New England, the oldest and largest regional heritage organization in the United States. Historic New England's 38 homes, farms, and landscapes all open to the public in collections of over 1.5 million irreplaceable artifacts, documents, and objects covering over 400 years of New England history reflect the integral support of private philanthropy and institutions. Much of philanthropy is personal. People respond to a cause or individual that has personal resonance, as is particularly the case today. For over 110 years, Historic New England has thrived because of the generosity of individuals who were personally invested in telling this region's complex story. This type of commitment fortunately extends to heritage projects around the world. Our Leading Voices program focuses on three exceptional resourceful leaders in the world of cultural and heritage philanthropy, all currently living in France. Two of them, Dr. Marjorie Arendt Sapphire, the elegant, dynamic, and incredibly accomplished artistic director of the Paris-based Arts Arena and president and director of the Arts Arena International, a nonprofit multidisciplinary initiative in the visual and performing arts, film, and issues of culture and society. And Alexandre Davogiwe, who, with his family, owns and runs the world-famous exquisite heritage site Chateau de Vaux le Vicomte. Our recipients of our third guest generosity, Dina Kay, a self-described unconventional philanthropist who leads the Danny Kay and Sylvia Fine Kay Foundation with personal passion, creativity, and engagement. Marjorie will be speaking with Dina and Alex in greater detail about them and their work. But first, let me tell you just a little more about Marjorie. She founded the Arts Arena in 2007 and for 13 years has made it an essential part of the French cultural fabric. Professor Emerita of Comparative Literature at the American University of Paris, she is the author, co-author, or editor of works on the leading figures of contemporary Latin American literature, as well as on science and the arts, and on theater artist Robert Wilson. Marjorie has been a member of the International Advisory Council of the Aspen Institute Global Initiative on Arts, Culture, and Society, a governor of Yale alumni, and a member of the board of directors of William Christie's Baroque Ensemble, Les Arts Florissants. I know how impressive Marjorie is because I am fortunate enough to be a past chairman of the Arts Arena Board, a champion of the arts, culture, and French and American heritage. It is my privilege to introduce Marjorie. Hello from three different locations in France. Today we're presenting in conversation a very exceptional philanthropist and two very different nonprofit recipients of her philanthropy. The philanthropist is Dina Kay, president of the Danny Kay and Sylvia Fine Kay Foundation, a glamorous philanthropist who does not seek glamour from her philanthropic giving. And the recipient nonprofits tonight with us are the famed Chateau de Volevicomte and the arts arena, two strikingly dissimilar kinds of cultural activity and thus of philanthropic needs. Dina Kay is the common denominator of these disparate cultural nonprofits, and that defines our conversation. Dina and I will be joined by Alexandre de Vaugouet, the eldest son of the family that owns the 17th century Chateau de Volevicomte. And I will then speak about the 21st century nonprofit that I founded, the Arts Arena. Together, Alex and I suggest the diversity and breadth of Dina's giving and are examples of Dina's rather unconventional approach to giving. It is now my great pleasure to present to you, first through her work in images and then in person, the very singular philanthropist behind this action. Like a 
could not better be, better be, better be. It could not possibly, no, sir, 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 Songs could not gayer be, sound your do, re o mi, re mi, fa so la si, fa la la la, fa lo mi. Why be gloomy? Cut thy nose off to spite thy face. Listen to me. A nose is hard to replace. Skies could not bluer be. Hearts in love truer be. I'd say for you or me. Life couldn't possibly not even probably. Life couldn't possibly better be. Life could not better be on a medieval spree. Nights full of chivalry, villains full of villainy. You'll see, as you suspect, maidens fair and silks bedecked. Each pride and true effect for the umpteenth time we resurrect. I am proud that at our Arts Arena Gala, when we recognized five outstanding individuals in the arts world, Mikhail Baryshnikov, James Ivory, Robert Storr, and Robert Wilson. The award for cultural philanthropy went to our guest tonight, Dina Kay. Dina, what do you understand by cultural philanthropy? First, thank you for that glorious introduction. I am unconventional, perhaps not glamorous, but definitely unconventional. And I think that's why cultural philanthropy for me is a much broader meaning than just arts and architecture. Um, it could be a philosophical culture of people united in a common goal. Let's say caregivers at a hospital are all interested in well-being. So that's a philosophical culture. Um, in our project in India, we created schools, a weaving, and a hospital. And that changed the social culture of that community because girls were then um, welcomed at school. The mothers-in-law weren't standing over them. They then got jobs. And so I see um, cultural philanthropy in that broad sense, and all of our grantees reflect that. Your father, Danny Kay, was the first UNICEF celebrity ambassador, but it was your mother who founded the foundation and handed it over to you with no instructions, I understand. How did you go about determining to whom you would give grants? Were there guidelines you created? And has your philosophy evolved over the years? Oh boy, that's one of those three prong questions. Um, I let me comment on my father for a moment. Um, my father wasn't involved at all in the foundation. He he gave of himself. Um, and when I, um, as you say, inherited the foundation with no guidelines, the philosophy involved as I started to meet people, and um, I suddenly realized after a couple years that. I had a philosophy of philanthropy and I had lots of good tutors who helped me with this. And so we basically have a five point um, program, I guess you could say, of how we give money away. And first it's giving to people. You and Alex are perfect examples of that. Um, I really have to like the people. And the reason is that we see philanthropy as a long-term relationship. Um, in fact, I think I could say that probably 80% of our grantees I've been friends with before we even got involved um, in making grants. And one amazing example of not having any intention of making a grant was we were in Granada looking at the Alhambra. And we then went to see a convent just because the person we were with decided it was a beautiful thing to see. And I went in and the nuns were just delightful and relaxed, answered all of my intimate questions and called me Dina and I was enchanted. And I saw a very dilapidated fountain in the courtyard. And I said, like I did to you in the apartment on the spot, I turned to Dick and I said, let's restore the fountain. So that's an example of, 
I didn't expect to give money and I certainly didn't know them, but it's just a visceral response to people. Um, the second thing is, what, what do people need? We don't come in saying, here's what we'd like to do for you. We say to you, what do you need? And we ask for a wish list. Three projects, three different price points. The third thing is, um, and Alex will say more about this, I know, because he's a prime, Vo is a prime example, is that we like to give unglamorous gifts. We like to give money for projects that are daunting to raise money for. So um, what have we done? We helped renovate an office space. Um, we have paid rent. Um, in, the, in the case of Vo, um, there was an, uh, I guess you'd call it an LLA or a pathway that all the golf carts go on and it takes um, tourists around, but also the staff in running the chateau. We repaved this. So this is a very unglamorous um, thing to do, but we love doing that because that's the hardest thing to raise money for. The fourth element, um, and I guess Marjorie, we did this with the arts arena, is we like to give grants that help the organization stand on their own. And we call those bootstrap, bootstrap grants. So that rather than giving money, for example, to a capital campaign for a building, we will give money to hire a manager for the capital campaign. We will hire a, and we have a PR expert um, so that the organizations have more, have more of a solid structure to move forward on their own. And the last thing um, really has to be in a response to the COVID crisis. And um, we know that all of our grantees, all of them still had to meet their budget and were deprived of the usual fundraising tools, whether it was a trip, uh, whether it was a gala. And so we went to each grantee and said, you know, what do you need? So we have done everything from um, pay and opera, pay opera singer salaries for the canceled performance. We've bought tickets so the performance that didn't happen wasn't sold out. Um, we financed the filming of a concert that could then be streamed live. And I, um, I would suspect that with all the unknowns about the current situation, we will we will continue to review really how our grantees are doing in this time. We're going to move for the moment to the famous heritage site, the Chateau de Vaux-le-Vicomte. Alexandre de Vaugouet, who is joining us from the slopes of Chamonix today, um, will speak about it. But let's look first at where Alexandre grew up and where he still lives. This is home. Hello, Alex. Hello, Marjorie. Tell us about home. <laughs> well, when was it built? What was the team? So, uh, Wolvicont is this um, very special place to our heart, of course, and to a lot of people because it's, uh, I think we can say it's a, one of the greatest masterpiece of not just architecture or garden design or decorative art, but a whole that has been built thanks to the vision of an amazing character, witty, intelligent, very ambitious. His name was Nicolas Fouquet, and he was the superintendent of finance under the young king Louis XIV. He had this fantasy of having the most beautiful house ever. First, because he was in love with the arts. He was a definitely amateur collector of arts. And second, because he wanted to fulfill his passion for ambition. He, was to, he wanted to fulfill his own ambition, to be as close as possible to the royal power and to have a beautiful home with the best artist of his time that he chose himself was a way to show his wealth, his intelligence and his taste. So uh, we are in 1649 when he bought the, the estate, when he bought the land, and 10 years after, uh, 1661, erected uh, the chateau and the garden of Vaux-Vicomte. Vaux 
is the largest privately owned historical monument in France. It receives subsidies from the French government, but the majority of your funding comes from private donations and you're instrumental in that in your role. Can you tell us about some of the projects that have been funded by private donations and the role they played at Vaux? Yes, well, first of all, let me just go back in terms of the history of the fundraising uh, strategy and possibility that we had only as a private institution uh, from um, 2009, before it was not possible to give a tax deduction to our donors. That was just uh, the case for the public institutions. So um, since 2009, uh, I came back to my family home in 2010 and by and hearing about that possibility, I told my family, this is definitely a source of revenues that we we'll definitely need. So let's try to figure out how we do fundraising. We didn't know anything about it. So I learned and I've been, you know, I've been inspired by amazing people around me and that and little by little, we put up this uh, uh, little department at the, at the, at the Chateau de Vaud-Vicomte, and we are today two people, two and a half. Um, by the way, we had before created by my parents uh, Ami, une association des amis de Vaud-Vicomte, which was fundraising, but not to the size and to the scale that we are doing it right now. The project are definitely the ones that we need most is the restoration of the historic monument that includes a garden. And if you think about the size of Vaudricon, you can imagine that uh, six acres of roofs definitely needs a lot of money to be restored. Thanks God, it happens only once, if everything goes well, once every, once every century. Um, we have 62 statues in the garden that has been restored by 45 or so donors. Um, we had to plant a new alignment of trees along the Grand Canal, 132 trees. We gave the possibility to the public to adopt a tree. And I, I have to say that America has been very early on, thanks to my aunt, my aunt who, who really uh, uh, pushed me to, uh, to be as proactive as possible in that field, um, as she was convinced that American Francophiles would be generous if we were doing a proper professional and thorough job about fundraising and our strategy. Well, let's turn to one American philanthropist. How did Dina enter into the life of Vaux? And we've already established that she's unconventional and does not go for the glamour project. So what did you propose to her? What interested her? Well, let me tell you about the story, this friendship. And, you know, as Dina was saying early on, uh, nothing can begin without a personal relationship. And that's exactly how our story began. That was quite a few years ago, I would say eight years ago. Uh, we were both invited at a lunch organized by a bank that was organizing once every two or three months, a lunch about with, um, with philanthropists and with a uh, main speaker that was carrying a project. And that day I was honored to be uh, one of this main speaker. Um, so I present Volvicont and the project. And very soon after that, Dina began to ask me some very down to earth, concrete operational questions about what we were doing, how we were doing things. If uh, the Chateau was linked with, the, with Paris with a shuttle, Etc. Etc. And at one point, it was like we had a conversation, just her and me, and we had forgotten completely about the other guest. Uh, but I thought, mm, this is someone that really is talking about business, about concrete way of trying to understand how a business such as Volvicon, because at the end of the day, it is a business, um, uh, uh, how Volvicon was was working, and. Um, at the end of the lunch, we were both waiting for a taxi ride, I guess, in the lobby. It was pouring rain and I asked Dina if she would like to share the taxi ride as we were going towards the east of Paris. And that's how we became friends. So 
thank you again, Dina, because we I I love this 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 friendship and we've been we've been building up this friendship and being more intimate, and uh, and I think that's the best way to do philanthropy to do fundraising. It is how delightful is is to work like this because it's not working. It's just joy. So this is for our story and um, and um, and. And the first project was this definitely non-glamorous project at all, because we had invest uh, into the fire alarm into the chateau. Um, so the fire alarm is definitely something that nobody sees. It is a tiny, as tiny as possible. It's hidden, you know, behind a bust or behind a tapestry. But it's of course absolutely vital for the safety and safeguard of the chateau. And I told Dina about that as we invested on the first part. And she said, well, how much is the second part and how are you going to do it? And what is the calendar? And I went into details and she said, yes, that's the kind of thing I want to help you out. Why? Because I know that, yes, you could open without this fire alarm, but what a huge responsibility, what a huge risk you are taking. And I know this money is going to be so essential for what you're doing at Volvicon. I just couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. I mean, who would be interested about fire alarm that it are absolutely invisible? And more than that, she said, you know, don't talk about me. Don't put my name or anything, you know, I'm just want, I'm just glad and happy to help Volvicon in that way. I mean, who can uh, dream about a better donor? That is for sure. And as I said, today we want to underscore the different kinds of organizations that Dina Kay has favored in her generosity. And it's hard to find something in a basic way more opposite to Vaux, which is 17th century and is a national monument, a heritage site stone then the nonprofit I'm going to talk about now, um, which is the Arts Arena. It's young, and I founded it in 2007. It has absolutely no physical home, so we are proof that of Dina's attitude because we don't have a wing or a gallery to put a name on, and yet we have been, as I've said, very favored by Dina. The arts arena is somewhat different as a nonprofit. What makes that singular is that all arts arena events, performances, lectures, conversations, debates, festivals, exhibitions are open to the public and free of charge. And that includes a reception where the public and the invited artist or cultural luminary meet and mingle. I like to say that at the arts arena, a woman who could buy the Paris opera could be seated next to a woman who cannot buy a ticket to the Paris opera and both have the same access to the same cultural actors and experience. All of the artists who appear at the arts arena donate their time. And one of the things that I feel proudest of is how many of them return to do so time and again. The question I'm most often asked about the arts arena is why? Why the arts arena? But first, what? The arts arena is a nonprofit initiative in the visual and performing arts, film, and issues of culture and society. Our mission is to strengthen connections among artistic disciplines and between the arts and the worlds of business, economics, cultural diplomacy, sciences, technology, and sustainable development. Since our founding in 2007, we've presented over 300 cultural events in Paris and some in New York, available to the broadest possible audience without, regardless, re without regard to financial resources. Mm -hmm. Three decisions were made in the beginning and have defined us ever since. One is to invest in content, not a physical space. 
To take from Hemingway, like Paris, the arts arena is a movable feast. We hold our events everywhere in the city. The word barter has in it the word art, as does the word partner. And we have been able to trade what we do have, exceptional programming thanks to the artists, for what we don't have, physical space, in order to partner with well-established institutions. Whether the venue is exquisitely gilded or funky, a national monument or a loft, all of the venues are lent to the arts arena free of charge because the institutions believe in what we're doing. We've partnered with the Banque de France, the Louvre Museum, the Aspen Institute, the Cinémathèque Française. Decision two, we would not call ourselves an American center because we believe that we best represent America by, yes, of course, showcasing American culture, but also by showing our openness to other cultures. Three, Arts Arena events are free and open to the public. Free of charge, including a reception, I have to admit, is not a great business model. It's a conviction and a commitment. 14 years after our founding, we still have no physical building, but we have a power to convene. We have built a community, an ethic, an audience across a staggering array of topics. If you want, we have built a culture. And now we come back to philanthropy and to you, Dina. I turn to you with the question with which I opened. You have project, projects around the globe, a considerable number in the cultural area, including, as we've seen, the wonderful Volvicomte. Why, for you, the arts arena? For everything you just said. I mean, the, first of all, we met and we became friends. And so I could see um, what the arts arena was. And Marjorie, I love you dearly, but you're just an exceptional person with a powerful vision and bless you, the power to convince people who, who might not give their time otherwise to such a small organization to come be part of the arts arena. So I have nothing but admiration for you. Um, and you're, frankly, you're, you're a one woman show. Well, thank you. And in closing, I would like to confess that Alexandre de Beauvais and I have let the secret out. Dina Kay is a nonprofit's dream cultural philanthropist. She is involved as much as we want her to be and no more. <laughs> she is creative. She has incredibly good ideas and she is fun, a not negligible asset in philanthropy. Thank you, Dina, for being who you are. Already in this very young year, we have witnessed that the preservation of culture and societal values has never been more important to civic and civilized society than now. Dearest Marjorie and dearest Alex, I'm, what I'm hoping is that our conversation will inspire other people to be freer um, and to follow their instincts about what they're doing and to have fun with it. Because the great reward in philanthropy is being part of it. Um, and both of you speak so truly to my heart um, in that experience. And let me just add to that, thank you to Historic New England and Da Vinci Cola for putting on this series of leading voices and for inviting Dina, myself, and Alex to be part of it. Marjorie and Alex, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with Dina and her effective, very personal approach to philanthropy. And Dina, thank you for your generosity, leadership, and candor. To find out more about our guests today, as well as our other leading voices and Historic New England's heritage work, please visit historicnewengland.org slash leadingvoices. On behalf of Historic New England, I'm Vince Cipolla. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>